So, uh, my name is John Vendor. Um, you can find me in those places. Uh, I work at Adobe. I work full time on jQuery Mobile. Um, the reason that is so enormous uh, is because I'm really grateful for the fact that I get paid money to work in open source. Uh, so, Adobe is taking kind of a big stance on doing this, and I'm one of the benefactors. Um, I was prior to that uh, a Rubyist full time, so I'm not a total sellout. Um, I do still really like Ruby. Okay, so uh, what are we really addressing here today? So what is this talk actually about? This talk is about really big classes. So I think everybody is familiar with, or just a quick show of hands. How many of you in here are Rails developers? Okay, like everybody. Um, <clears throat> how many of you have seen the gigantic user class in a Rails application? Yeah, right, okay. <laughs> so, uh, right, so this is like, this is a pretty common, this is a pretty common thing. Uh, these gigantic classes, it's pages and pages and pages to, to find methods. Uh, so I kind of want to I want to address that a little bit today with this as a technique. So um, there's a couple existing solutions out there um, for large, really large classes, and, and so one of them is uh, I like to call it mix in all the things. Um, there's a couple, so you don't need to be able to read this, but if you guys have ever looked into, at the internals of auth logic, there's a session. And, and to be clear, all the code examples I use for like public projects and other people's projects, I'm not here to bag on other people. Um, I'm just here to use these as examples. But if you look in uh, off logic, yeah, it, the session base class is just basically a big include. So everything is in other modules. And about the only thing this gets you is, is you don't have to scroll down, like things are grouped logically. Uh, other than that, it's just moving the code around. Okay, and then uh, the other one is object composition. So this is sort of like when you think about uh, 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 refactoring a code base, a lot of times it involves some form of object composition. Um, and just, just as a quick review, what is object composition? So if I have a lamp um, and I'm dependent on finding out, my, my needs maintenance method is dependent on finding out the bulb age. Um, this, this might, and, and this is a very simple example, right? So you, you, you're not necessarily gonna have to worry about refactoring something that's 10 lines, but as an example, this works. So the bulb age is sort of contained in the lamp class. So we just switch this out by injecting the bulb in and then asking the bulb itself, so delegate. And that's composition. You're, you're adding, you're using your has a relationship to move uh, code into another place where it makes sense. Okay, so super simple. This is the most basic form of object composition. There's a lot of different types and ways to do this. And part of them we'll discuss today. This rack middleware as an abstraction is sort of uh, just another form of object composition. Okay, so uh, Shane counseled me to do this as a, like a, uh, a survey. So this will how many of you use middleware when you say middleware if you say it at all in the singular? So when you say middleware, you're talking about one thing. Okay, there's three, three stooges over here and then some people in the back, right? Uh, how many of you use it in the plural, middleware? Okay, you have to raise your hand for something. This is not a, this is not an odd Okay, okay. So most of you use plural. Okay, so I'm going to use it interchangeably. If that bothers you, I'm really sorry. Uh, I might occasionally use middle fangs as a replacement for the plural. <laughs> okay, so let's let's do a quick review. So it's for obviously to understand the middleware thing as a as a, a general purpose abstraction, we obviously have to look at what it looks like when it's used in its kind of native environment. So let's take a look at a, at a quick review uh, of rack middleware. Uh, how many of you in here know how rack middleware works? How, how each of okay. So that's that's actually pretty good. So when I gave this presentation uh, like a month ago, it wasn't quite that good. Um, but this will this will be a good review for those that uh, do know. And you have to cover it anyway if you don't. Okay, so when I say middleware, middleware means a lot of different things in software, right? So when I say middleware, I really mean middleware as it's envisioned in Pet 333. Um, and if you've never read this, uh, it's actually kind of an interesting read because the whole purpose is more just to bridge the gap between servers and frameworks. But they sort of threw this in here as like the added incentive. You know, it's like the, the extra set of knives you get when you're buying, you know, OxyClean off the, on, off the TV or whatever. <laughs> Uh, the middleware was just an incentive for people to to get excited about using this bridge between the server and the framework. And uh, so anyway, it's a good read. You should definitely check it out. It's a nice little bit of background. It's not very long. Either. 
Okay, so uh, these middleware, they're very concerned with request processing. So the request as it comes in and the response as it goes back out. It, it gives them the opportunity to alter them. Uh, so this is what a middleware stack looks like. Now, specifically, this sits between the server and your, uh, your, your uh, framework. So in Rails, it's between whatever uh, server du jour you're using and Rails. Uh, there's stuff that happens there. Rails, uh, at, the, at the refactor, the, the big refactor for 3.0 moved a lot of stuff into this middleware space because it really makes sense because it's just request processing. It doesn't really belong in the framework level. So they kind of pulled it out and made it available. Uh, so this is what a stack looks like. And the stack operates uh, top down. So the request comes in at the top. The very, first, the very first middleware there at the top gets the opportunity to operate on the request first and then it proceeds down the stack. So let's take a look at uh, just an example middleware. Um, so first things first, before it ever receives a request, it gets initialized. And when it gets initialized, it gets the next middleware in the stack as the first argument to its constructor. So it is aware uh, of the next middleware. And that's extremely important, as we'll see in a second, because it, it is the responsibility of each middleware to call the next middleware. And this is the thing that defines the difference between a, a middleware and an endpoint, right? The endpoint does nothing further. It, it, does, it returns the, the response. So it would never make a call to another one. Okay, so in that case, the app, the thing passed into the constructor, is the common model. So when you run the server, uh, again, the request comes in, goes top to bottom. First, it'll hit the uh, our example middleware. Um, the call method is invoked on that middleware. It gets a hash. So the hash, the environment hash, and it's funny because they call it environment because it's just a big fat stink bag. Uh, is represents the request. It's it's got headers. It's got everything that that you need in the request to deal with the web request, right? So an HTTP request, and then uh, you can manipulate it or you can not manipulate it. Um, but one thing that you have to do if you're being good access is you have to pass it on to the next middleware. So you can do stuff before, and you'll know here that you can do something after too, right? So you have the opportunity afterwards to do whatever you want with the response. So it's very general, but you have a lot of responsibility. You have to do the right thing with the request and the response. Uh, so as I said earlier, endpoints. The differentiation here with Vagrant's middleware, which I'll discuss in a minute, and, and Rack middleware, is that uh, uh, Vagrant's middleware sort of throws in a lambda at the end, so you just call something. So you can just, you just as a middleware, keep calling the next one, and don't worry about it. It'll sort of handle it for you. Whereas with Rack, um, you have to check to make sure that there is a middleware if you're going to be both an endpoint and a middleware. If you're going to be an endpoint, you just get the, re the request and return response and don't call anything else. You're never going to get another app to call. You're never going to get the next bit. So that's the difference between an endpoint and a middle thing. Okay, so at this point, I just want to I just want to make sure that's all clear because this is obviously very foundational for the rest of the talk. Does anybody have any questions about how this works? And I realize nerd conferences, it's sort of not cool to raise your hand if you're not sure what's going on upstairs, but that, that's fine. Uh, if you have a question, I would prefer you ask it now so you can understand the rest of the Anybody? Cool. I would just assume that you are all in deep understanding of this other thing. All right, so let's talk about Vagrant. Um, if you're interested in Vagrant after this talk, during the talk, you know, definitely check it out. This is, uh, I co-created Vagrant with Mitch. I am an erstwhile contributor to it, though I do not contribute at all anymore. I think like, I contributed like a year ago. Here it was. Anyway, uh, how many of you have used Vagrant and know what Vagrant is? All right, Ooh, that's great. Okay, ops folks, I'm sure. Um, Anyway, the internals of Vagrant we're going to discuss here today. Uh, we'll touch a little bit on what it does, but not really. It's sort of <coughs> anyway, definitely check it out. Uh, what, uh, in general, if you've never heard of Vagrant, it works on virtual machines. So uh, it lets you deal with virtual machines locally. It kind of streamlines the whole process of using them for development. So there's a lot of stuff that goes on when you want to use a virtual machine locally that takes a lot of time. You've got to install an operating system. You have to do port forwarding. You have to do folder sharing, all that stuff. That's a lot of clicking around. Uh, this automates a lot of it. So there's a lot of operating on virtual machines um, as objects. So let's just take a look at one command. So Vagrant, when I have a virtual machine that I'm working with in Vagrant, and I want to suspend the virtual machine, this is a relatively simple operation. So, a good example. so this is what, generally, this is what uh, the middleware stack looks like for suspending a virtual machine. So these are the operations that need to take place for a virtual machine to be suspended. And this is the way that Vagrant does it. It builds a stack of operations, and the virtual machine, or the environment containing the virtual machine, will get trickled down through those 
and stuff will happen. So let's take a look at it directly. As I said, top to bottom, virtual machine will go down. Uh, inside an environment, although it's easy enough to think of it as a virtual machine to do it. So let's take a look at validate first. So real, real simple. So on uh, when we run the command on invocation, um, it does it checks to see if your config is valid. So if you uh, Vagrant does configuration, you build virtual machines through through, through a Ruby DSL doing configuration, and it has to validate them, right? If you're doing something wrong in the Ruby config file, obviously it can't. It doesn't want to deal with your VM because it might screw something up. So it yells at you and says, "You're doing it wrong." And then it calls the next middleware, which in this case is check accessible. So this is um, in your VMs can get into a state in VirtualBox where you can't deal with them or monkey with them. So this just checks to make sure that's not the case before it goes off and tries to monkey with them. It calls the next environment, uh, which is spend. So this is where the magic happens, obviously. And this is really simple. So it just asks the driver. So this could be one of two things, depending on which version you're using. This could be the API, the C API that VirtualBox provides. Or it could be actually a, uh, an exec or of the VBox managed command. Either way, what ends up happening here is your VM gets suspended. And that's important, as I said earlier. There isn't actually another middleware here to be called, right? Uh, but Vagrant sort of handles that for you. Let's say you're creating a plugin and you, you just don't have to think about it, right? You just be a good citizen and call the next one. Because there are really no endpoints here. There's nothing to return back up the stack necessarily. You're just operating on the VM. So that's an important difference between this. Okay, so figuring up. So this is the big one. This is I have nothing, and I'm going to create a VM from scratch. Uh, and obviously, there's a lot more operations than are in suspend. Uh, particularly, uh, particular interest again. You don't have to read this. These are the same two commands that were same two operations that were at the top of the suspend uh, stack, right? So we're getting a lot of reuse here because there's there are similar operations that have to take place in almost all the commands. Um, when you build them this way, when you compose these operations together this way, you get it's easy to reuse them. Um, generally speaking, though, if you were if you were building this uh, from scratch and you weren't using this abstraction, there may be something else you would use. But your VM, uh, you can see VM all the way over there, to left, all the way down the bottom, right? If you were to shove all this into your VM class, it would be gigantic, right? The, the VM class would be enormous. <laughs> uh, and, and, and that was the original thing as we were working on it that we came to is we, we realized really early on, we were Rails developers before we started working on this, we didn't like having these gigantic classes where it was hard to figure out what your method dependencies were. You, you had to bounce around. I mean, it wasn't easy to test because there were all these weird, uh, you had to set up the object. Um, and so we knew very early on we had kind of an intermediate step between uh, bloated VM class uh, and middleware that was this kind of action thing. You can go through the GitHub history or the Git history and check that out. But that's something we wanted to avoid. Okay, is it clear at this point how Vagrant uses middleware to operate on VMs? Is that clear to everybody? Okay, great. All right, I'm not completely failing in my job here. That's good. Okay, so uh, to I want to refactor something that's out there now as a public piece of software. Um, I chose the Diaspora user because, honest to God, it was the first Rails application I could think of that was like open source. I mean, I'm sure there's other ones, but it's the first thing that popped to mind. Uh, and actually, their user class isn't like gigantic. It's pretty, it's, I mean, it's, it's big. But it's no bigger than any other Rails user class. It's, it's, it's pretty good. So let's take a look at, I mean, just to get a sense for how big it actually is. Um, I don't know how long this, okay. Uh, right, so, and it goes on for like a couple more pages, right? So it's a big, it's a really, really big class. Um, <laughs> ideally, what we do here is we find some. We want to find some methods that are dependent on each other. Some some group methods, some things that fit together, so that we can we can pull those out into an object and then compose it using this kind of middleware idea. Okay, so let's take let's take a method and turn it into middleware. Uh, first thing I noticed that it doesn't have a lot of dependencies, so it kind of makes it kind of makes sense. Uh, for this is they have an accept invitation method. I am not paying attention at all to what these things do, only just moving them out into a class. Okay, so I'm assuming that this accepts some sort of invitation based on the name. I think it does. Uh, if you want to take a look at it yourself and get back to me, you're welcome. Okay, so this is this is the method as it is. Again, I don't care what it's doing. You don't need to worry about reading it. Just know that it's hard. And that's that's enough to know that it should be changed. I guess. Uh, it's really big, and so what I want to do is I want to move this out into a class. So, and remember, we have the call, like the, the call method uh, convention, right? So we're going to stick this into a class that has a method call, and this will be like the method in which things are done when this this middleware is used, right? So let's let's move that over. And the one thing that you need to take note of is that there's just that one dependency. So this method is actually pretty 
I mean, it's big enough. I mean, it kind of contains everything. Um, it only has the setup uh, method dependency, and that's another method of user class. So if we move this over, there's a couple things that need to happen. And again, I'll explain this. You don't have to worry about reading. Um, we need to we need the user, right? We need the thing to operate on. Um, and there's two kind of ways you can do this. You can say, I want you know, I want just a hash that'll have this stuff to operate on, and then I'll worry about getting it out of the hash. Or you could say it's the user, uh, and then maybe another argument. You can do it any way you want. Um, it doesn't really matter to me. Uh, this is just sort of easy to illustrate because we're used to the convention of having just a state bag. That we're going to pass on. So up there, uh, again, I'm, I'm going to talk to you about it. There's a user in the in this state bag that we're going to get out and then operate on, right? So previously, the method just referenced self everywhere. It's at self dot something and did some stuff. So now we're just going to change that uh, just to be user everywhere. Okay, so we haven't, like, notice the code isn't, this isn't like a, a, a painful refactoring, right? We've got a pretty quick step over to doing this. Uh, and then at the bottom, you have, like, the, the call to the next app necessarily, right? And I think down there it's missing environment, so that's my fault. Um, that's about all you had to do is add those two things. So add, add some extraction of the user object to operate on from the environment. Uh, and in this case, it has some options that needs all over. And then, or use... And then down at the bottom, putting in the call to the next middleware should it exist. Okay, and then the setup method has to do the same thing. So uh, specifically, when I got that user out of the environment, I set it to an instance variable, and then just like uh, attribute accessible or whatever. So user, make the alterations in the setup method, which is called uh, uh, previously in the, um, the call method. Um, and then this sort of handles. So it's all, it's all, we wrap these two things into a class of its own, right? Okay, so this is the controller where this happens, um, just for reference. Uh, it gets a user, finds an, a user by its invitation token, and then accepts the invitation. Um, and in this case, that should actually be user over here when we change it to this in a second. So it accepts the invitation. Uh, so, this, so what I've done now to kind of proxy this over is I've said, let's just leave the accept invitation, everything else the same everywhere. And just do what we would normally do, just use the class inside of the user. So take our middleware class of users. So this is like the simplest possible implementation of delegating this out to another class. So we, uh, it's, it, the first option is to instantiate the middleware and then just do a call with the options. Super simple. And then the other one is if you want to spend a little more time, you can put together some infrastructure where you can sort of have a registry of these middleware to use and just kind of map them to symbols or something and then just run them off like that. So it's a little easier to read maybe. Uh, and that, and I, I'm not going to illustrate what this, this machinery would look like. You can look at Rack, or you can look at Vagrant as a reference. Uh, Vagrant has a little bit of indirection because Mitch, uh, Mitch wanted to make it easier for people to work with, but it's still followable. But this stuff can be really simple. This isn't super hard. Okay, so what do we buy ourselves here, uh, other than you know, just moving code around, like I said earlier? Okay, a couple things. Uh, this is my awesome testing code. Uh, it mocks stuff you probably shouldn't mock, but the point is, is that it's really easy to test now. It's its own contained object, right? Your tests can be kind of simple. You can mock things. And there's a sense that when you look at something and you can fit it all on one screen, it's not, and you, you're aware of what all the method dependencies are, right? Because it's all fitting within that class. You don't have to worry about breaking something when you decide to refactor, it, right? It's all sitting there right in front of you. You don't have to go searching through the gigantic class for possible method dependencies. Um, also, and this is, I'm not, I'm not trying to advocate prefactoring this type of stuff, but in the future, should you, uh, should you decide to have kind of a, a set of steps that people have to go through when they accept an invite or something to that effect? Uh, so for example, let's say, that, um, let's say that when you sign in through the web interface, you're sort of marked as a new for whatever reason. And then they have some sort of API that you can hit with curl that then would make you a veteran of some sort. So you want to, both, both of these times you want to accept the invite, but maybe you want to do something extra in those cases. So you have your new stack and your veteran stack. Okay, so let's let's wrap. I just want to wrap this up. What are some signs that this is a good abstraction for you to use in your code? Uh, so obviously reuse. We just talked about this. Um, when you need to have the same functionality running all over the place, and you're tempted to use a mix-in, uh, think about using object composition. Even I mean, even if just just use object composition if you even if you're not sure about the middleware thing. Well, you know, don't avoid using mixins all the time, but this works really well. And if you wanted to get a little more complex as a consequence, now you can kind of compose these things together as a, as a whole action. 
Uh, so serial, serial method invocation. So a lot of times you'll see methods that are just wrappers for other, a bunch of other methods. So like run this thing or run this process, right? Uh, where you just call out to a bunch of other methods. You may not even have arguments. So you can kind of map that over to middleware, right? And this sort of assumes that you have reason to, to abstract these out into a middleware themselves, right? So var as a backer ostensibly large uh, methods or have a lot of dependencies and kind of can be well um, Alternately, because the one on the right would mean you're kind of instantiating your stack every time, uh, you, you store your stack somewhere so that it's available and you just make a call a class method or something like that. Uh, obviously, I'm aware that that is not a class variable. Uh, so another one is function composition. So um, when you're composing a bunch of methods where you're just sort of firing off stuff along the way, uh, taking a taking you know some arguments and then passing the result back and forth, you can do the same thing here uh, by just comp again composing the methods as middleware instead of the methods. And that is it. Thank you.